And now uh, to the second part of, of this talk, which is really about negation handling in sentiment analysis. So what is that, right? Well, here is the problem with negation in sentiment analysis. This is an actual product review uh, from the Amazon Product Reviews Corpus. Uh, this is what it says. This product truly did not live up to the expectations, semicolon, or advertised results, will not repurchase, do not recommend it, right? So my question to you as a a fully functional adult human, and this is the sentiment analysis part, do you think this is more likely to be a five-star positive review, a three-star neutral review, or a one-star negative review? And uh, most adults <laughs> are going to say that this is pretty negative review, right? It's a one-star review right here. And the problem is that many state-of-the-art sentiment analyzers actually say it's a positive review, right? And you might be thinking to yourself, what? <laughs> why? Why would, why would you think this is a positive review? The problem is negation. So words like not are negation terms. And so the problem is the inability to correctly handle negation, which can drastically alter the sentiment expressed. Like imagine if you actually did nothing and you just ignored the nuts here. All of a sudden, this seems like a pretty positive review. This product truly did live up to expectations, will repurchase, do recommend it. That's sounding pretty positive, right? So in, improper handling of negation can really mess things up, right, on certain kinds of reviews like these. And so there are two components to handling negation. And the first is to detect what's called the scope of negation, which is here in the light blue. That's what parts of the message get their sentiment altered by negation. So usually things that are appearing after, though not always, uh, the negation term as we see here. And the second part is to resolve that negation, right? You want to update the sentiment of the language within the scope of negation, right? And, and fix it so it has the right sentiment, the intended sentiment. And so we're going to focus today on negation resolution, since there actually seem to be some pretty good approaches out there for scope detection. The issue is more what to do about it once you've identified that something, in fact, needs to be done. So let's focus on a simpler example, just because I'm going to walk through some different approaches right now. So this is not good. Okay, we have negation, we have the sentiment word good, uh, which needs to be resolved. And so considering current symbolic approaches, many of them rely on a sentiment lexicon that provides the, the base sentiment score, usually say, for example, ranging between negative one and one uh, for words and phrases that are in that lexicon. And here, this is just a list of a bunch of different lexicons that do that. And the sentiment is what gets altered if it's in the scope of negation. So the base sentiment of good, I'd say in one of these sentiment lexicons would be 0.66, right? So it's kind of on the positive side of the world. And you want to alter that, right, if it's in the scope of negation. So there are several existing approaches to therefore altering that base sentiment score. And one of them is, is, is the simplest one, is just invert it, right? So if good is 0.66, then not good can be negative 0.66, right? That's kind of negative. Right? And the problem sometimes is that relative sentiment scores get messed up. So terrible in the same lexicon that told us that good was 0.66, so on the positive side of the world, told us that terrible has a base sentiment of negative 0.7 on the negative side of the world. Nothing wrong with that. But if you invert terrible, not terrible, you end up with 0.7. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is that what you're telling me is that not terrible, in fact, is, is more positive than good, right? So if I say, wow, that's good, you have one impression, wow, that's not terrible, you probably think it's not as good as good, right? And that's not what these inverted sentiment scores are telling us, right? So you can run into that kind of problem with inversion. Uh, so an observation that some people made was that negating positive terms like good seems to involve a different amount of, of sentiment shifting, if you will, than negating negative terms like terrible. So for example, positive terms get more of a shift downwards. So you go from good to not good, you're like down here, right? It's kind of it's bad, right? Uh, while negative terms maybe get less of a shift upwards. So terrible, not terrible maybe is still kind of negative, right? Doesn't get as much of a shift. So this approach uh, is, if implementing this is asymmetrical shift, you know, an asymmetry in the amount of shifting, where positive terms shift one amount and negative terms shift a different lesser amount, typically. 
another observation that people made was that a term's base sentiment score may not actually capture all the components necessary to accurately compute its negated sentiment score. So one solution was to say, well, maybe what we can do is leverage a term's antonym, right? So bad is the opposite, the antonym of good. And because an antonym is likely to be more closely connected to the nuances of that initial term's meaning, and we can therefore use the antonym's base sentiment score as the negated score for the original term. So good's antonym is bad, so we have a base score of negative 0.5, so therefore not good can have a score of negative 0.5, where good had a base sentiment of 0.66. Now this is great. Um, the problem, oftentimes actually, is reliably finding a term's antonym. So let's look at the term recommend, which was actually in our original product review that I showed you. And if you try to look up what its antonym is in sort of a standard repository of antonyms, uh, like WordNet, uh, you can't find one. Okay, well you say, well, you know, maybe we can look for synonyms. Where does it kind of mean the same thing, like urge and advocate? Well, neither of those has antonyms in WordNet. And you're like, maybe related forms like recommendation or urgency. Uh, and these antonyms are not in WordNet, right? So you can run into this problem kind of a lot, right? So it maybe is hard to find a term's antonym, right? But the idea that nuances of meaning may matter seems right. So one linguistic intuition that we had was that how specific a term's meaning is may impact how much it actually gets shifted. So if we consider these terms, good, nice, and beautiful, they actually are all pretty darn positive, right? And in fact, if we think about how specific they are, beautiful feels more specific than good, sort of like, and nice is maybe in between them, right? And in fact, when you negate them, right, not good is, is pretty bad, not nice is maybe a little less bad, and not beautiful, maybe, <laughs> maybe it's still pretty good, right? And these are actually our shifted scores from a study that actually assessed them. So like these are real differences, right? Even though these terms started out with the same basic sentiment score. So how do we tell then how specific a term's meaning is besides our lovely sort of intuitions as humans? And some ideas are that maybe we should pay attention to the frequency, right? Maybe less frequent terms are more specific and that's maybe like why they appear less frequently. Uh, maybe we should also pay attention to the variety of contexts that these words appear in, like terms that appear in fewer contexts may be more specific. They're only appropriate in certain contexts. That makes them more specific, right? So frequency and variety of contexts. And we can have some heuristics that we might use to approximate them. So frequency, we can just maybe calculate from a, a large enough corpus. In fact, the Amazon product reviews corpus has like 82.8 million reviews in it. So we can kind of get relative frequency of, of a term. Uh, and the variety of contexts we can actually approximate with the heuristic of inverse dispersion, which ranges between zero and one. And zero means you have a uniform, uh, uniform excuse me, distribution across contexts, while one means you pretty much only appear in a single context, right? Like very not uniform. And this is actually calculated by summing the difference of the observed relative frequency of a particular term versus the expected relative frequency if there were a uniform distribution across contexts and you divide by two so you get a nice range between zero and one. But basically, how different are you from uniform? If you're not different, guess what? You're uniform. If you're really different, you're not uniform, right? So variety of contexts can be captured by this inverse dispersion measure. So we calculated this as well from that same 82.8 million Amazon product review corpus, and we took the approach that people tend to use for, for this kind of analysis of dividing our corpus into sort of 10 equal sized sections as context. So great. Frequency, we have inverse dispersion, these like heuristics of meaning specificity. Um, how do we combine these two quantities in a sensible way, and one answer is to do a multiple regression with the data coming from a set of terms whose ground truth, both the base sentiment score and the negated score, we feel pretty certain about, right? And we have data like this. We have 42 terms that were extracted and manually checked from a particular uh, study that looked at both base sentiment and negated sentiment. And the resulting negation calculation equation, the regression equation, uh, is this, using these terms, right? So the negated score, that is if you want to get not good, that's going to depend on a constant. And it's going to depend on the base score a little bit, right? So negative 0.39, so 0.39 on the base score. It's going to depend more 
on the relative frequency uh, of good and the inverse dispersion of good individually, right? About now we're in the twos instead of 0.39. And it's going to depend a heck of a lot more on the interaction of frequency and inverse dispersion, like two orders of magnitude more, right? But you know, but this is what we can use to sort of approximate right? Incorporating meaning specificity into that negation resolution process, right? And so something we did was like, okay, let's do a sanity check. Does adding in this heuristic meaning specificity information help us at all at this negation resolution, at getting that negated score? And information theory says that if we use this meaning specificity approach, that is this, these heuristics, right, of frequency inverse dispersion and their interaction, when trying to calculate the negated score, given the base score, good things happen. We find information gain, that is a decrease in entropy compared to not using meaning specificity information at all, right? Just using the base sentiment score. And we in fact find 4.2 times the information gain compared with using just random meaning specificity values. So like, in fact, calculating them correctly is probably a good idea, right? And get information gain from that. So information theory says, yes, this is not crazy. And we also did an exploratory decision tree analysis where we forced the maximum depth of three to kind of find like the top three features one might use. This also showed information gain when relying on the meaning specificity features, so frequency, inverse dispersion, and their interaction, as opposed to just base sentiment score. So like, not crazy to think that this might get us some mileage. So therefore, let's try our meaning specificity approach in an actual pipeline that involves negation resolution, where the goal is to classify a product review involving negation as either positive, neutral, or negative. And we can compare it against all the other approaches I talked about, inversion, asymmetrical shift, and the antonym dictionary approach, as well as a baseline of like literally doing nothing when encountering negation, right? Like, like it doesn't get much worse than that, you just ignore it. And so remember then that there are two key parts of a sentiment analysis pipeline. The first is to detect the scope of uh, negation, like what needs to be resolved. That's all the stuff in the blue. And as I said, there are several state-of-the-art methods for doing this. Uh, four grams, parsedry is a, a machine learning tool that was tuned to this sort of thing. And since we don't know, you know, a priori which will work best, we're going to just try them all out, right, in combination with our different resolution methods. And then, of course, we have the resolution, which is going to be one of these different options. And then, last part, we actually have to aggregate the different sentiment scores into one score for the entire review. And there are kind of two ways to do this. We can try flat averaging, just, just average your scores, or aggregate structurally using a parse tree. Again, a priori, we don't know which one will work better, so eh, we'll use both of them. And next question, what kind of reviews do we want to evaluate these approaches on? Right, and you're like, well, reviews with negation, of course. True, basic data is gonna be a collection of reviews that just have negation in them. So we have 10,000 reviews that we grab from the Amazon product reviews corpus that have negation in them. Um, but we also maybe wanna look at uh, harder data, right? A collection of reviews that have negation in them and the presence of negation has a serious impact. It changes the sentiment. It changes the valence from positive to negative or from negative to positive. And we have 10,000 of these. So the upshot is that on the hard data, doing nothing will definitely get the wrong answer, right? Your baseline is zero on the hard data set, okay, when we do nothing. So we have these two data sets. And the evaluation metric we're going to use is a, a, a random index plus partial credit kind of thing, RI plus partial. It's a version of the random index, also known as accuracy in the, in the NLP community, that gives partial credit, right? So the first part is your standard random index. You get full credit for correctly classifying negative reviews as negative, neutral reviews as neutral, and positive reviews as positive. Great, that's your standard rand index. The second part is the partial credit part. We're going to give you half credit for classing, classifying negative reviews as neutral or positive reviews as neutral instead of completely getting it wrong and just come and swapping the sentiment entirely. And the reason we did this is we thought, well, it's not as egregious an error as classifying positive reviews as negative or negative reviews as positive. Like you, you got part way there. You didn't completely mess it up. So we're going to give you partial credit for that. 
So therefore, the evaluation metric is the combination of both the full credit and the partial credit uh, divided by all 10,000 classifications that you made. So here's what we found. So on the basic data set, where it's like you know, just a review that has negation in it, uh, the range of our RI partial thing, which ranges from 0 to 1, uh, the scores, the success, if you will, was between 0.557 and 0.638. You know, kind of like in the 50s or 60s. Uh, and in fact, the best performance was achieved by inverting, like the super simple thing, right? Like literally the simplest thing you could do. I guess except for nothing. But guess what? Doing nothing already gets you to 0.629 of this partial, this performance. So that may explain why the overly simplistic inverting approach does so well, because handling negation cleverly doesn't get you much mileage in these basic cases. And you might be wondering, why is that, right? So here's an example of one of our, our basic data points that has, an, that has negation in it. This is the negation word won't. It has that unt in there, which is a negation word. So this case is as cute as it is durable. Your phone sits in a rubber casing that fits very snug. Your phone won't be falling out. OK, so let's look at here. So the sentiment words, really sentiment bearing words, are mostly very positive. And you have one negative one, like falling out, right? And that's under the scope of negation. So, OK, so I, ideally what you would like to do is like negate this thing and like make this into a positive. But suppose you do nothing. Suppose you like literally do nothing and you just kind of aggregate this stuff together. Well, a bunch of positives and a little negative is still probably going to get you positive, right? Which, in fact, is the right sentiment here. So doing nothing can work pretty well if what negation is doing is not that important to the overall sentiment of the review. So let's instead turn to the hard cases where doing nothing guarantees you the wrong sentiment. And in fact, the one that I showed you at the very beginning is one of these hard cases. You have negation, and it really impacts what happens. So if you like ignore negation, you have a lot of very positive sentiment words. And in fact, you think, oh, hey, this is a positive review, when in fact, it's actually quite a negative review, right? So these are our hard cases. And here, we actually find a range of performance from 0.272 to 0.658, right? So much broader range already. And the top, the best performing approach is meaning specificity. It gets you the best performance and a much higher boost over the lower performing approaches on these hard cases, which by definition are hard, where, you know, nothing gets you zero, right? So really, 0.658 is, is none too shabby in this world. And so the takeaway then really is that for hard cases, where negation really matters, where, where ignoring negation really is going to mess things up, it's going to be an egregious error to humans, a meaning specificity approach works the best. But more basic cases where negation doesn't have that much of an impact can get away with not doing anything particularly clever and still get the right sentiment.